Hong Kong is very much in the news. Uh, many of you, of course, are aware that four members of the Legislative Council had already been identified as being excluded from continuing on the council, from being able to be reelected because they were judged to be insufficiently committed to the unification of China, to China's territorial sovereignty. They were judged to have independence leanings. And suddenly they were expelled from that body. And out of solidarity, a number of other pro-democracy legislators, all of them, have resigned. And that has just happened. So this is very much in the news. Hong Kong is, of course, one of the most important financial centers in the world. And it has been an important place for people uh, going into, coming out of China, and a key place for those interested in trends in China. It, of course, was a British colony until 1997, when it was returned to Chinese control. We're going to be talking now with Professor Michael Davis, who since 1985 has been teaching constitutional law, human rights law, and a number of other topics in Hong Kong at a couple of different universities, at Chinese University of Hong Kong and the University of Hong Kong. He continues to teach in Hong Kong now uh, using distance learning at the University of Hong Kong. So he's still very much plugged in. And he'll tell you a little bit about his experience uh, in uh, fall of, of 2019, researching, uh, doing some of the research that ends up being in this book. Professor Davis was educated at Yale, at the University of California Hastings School of Law, and as I mentioned, has decades of experience teaching in Hong Kong. He's written a number of important books, including Constitutional Confrontation in Hong Kong, and that came out in 1990. His subsequent, one of his subsequent books, Human Rights and Chinese Values, came out in 1995. In addition to writing these academic books and publishing in academic journals, Professor Davis has been widely published in the popular press, including, for example, the South China Morning Post. His columns in the South China Morning Post, in fact, merited the Human Rights Press Award for 2014, an award that is given by Amnesty International, by the Foreign Correspondence Club of Hong Kong, and by the Hong Kong Journalists Association. He continues to publish widely. And this book was produced for the, universe, uh, for the Association of Asian Studies, Asian Sort Shorts series. And I just wanted to show it to you uh, so you can see this rather dramatic cover. The book has just come out. I've purchased it in its Kindle edition, uh, but you might want to go to the website uh, right away because right now they're having a 20% sale, 20% off sale. It's an excellent book, about 200 pages in length, covering Hong Kong's history and the current state of affairs. Today, we're going to talk with Professor Davis about the book and about what's happened since he sent the book uh, to the publisher. Michael, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for having me, Clay. I really appreciate the chance to talk to people on the West Coast, especially about this. Uh, we've done a few of these on the East Coast and in Hong Kong, but this is the first uh, in California. Well, we're delighted to have you with us, and we're delighted to have uh, people already have begun to submit questions. I've received a couple via email and this sort of thing. But you and I will just have a conversation at the outset. But folks, remember, you are welcome to post your questions in using that Q&A button. Uh, first off, uh, Professor Davis, some people think that uh, by withdrawing, by having the pro-democracy uh, legislators leave the Legislative Council, they've actually given Beijing exactly what it wants. 
free reign. What do you think? Well, you know, the, even the chief executive of Hong Kong was making press statements today, uh, the, proclaiming how easy now it was for the government to push through its agenda. She seemed quite pleased that she can do that without any resistance. Uh, some legislators, more prominent one, Regina Ip, who, who actually studied in California years ago uh, at Stanford, uh, is uh, also excited that they can push through things to get mainlanders, uh, Hong Kongers who live on the mainland, be able to vote in the Hong Kong elections. The pro-Beijing camp likes that because they think those people will support them and they can increase their, their, their share of the vote. Uh, they want to ram through other kinds of bills to impose patriotic education on Hong Kong youth and so on. But it's a really surprising level of arrogance in, in the pro-Beijing camp, the establishment camp, uh, in that they, they have chastened the, the uh, pan-democratic legislators for obstructionism and trying to block things in the legislative council for you know, all kinds of, using whatever kinds of tools that are available to filibuster and so on and stop bills from coming through. But what they, they never seem to acknowledge is those are the people that are there by virtue of the Hong Kong people putting them there. And, and so these, uh, what they're called the pan-democrats, or you can call them the opposition uh, legislators, they're the ones who, uh, you know, there are some pro-establishment legislators also directly elected, but not enough. I mean, the, the, when it comes to the direct election component of the Legislative Council, uh, half of the seats are directly elected. And the, the opposition always gets about 50 to 60 percent of the vote. So they've ever since even before the handover, uh, they've been the dominant force that represents the ordinary people of Hong Kong. And yet they're treated with such disdain when they attempt to do that in a system where seats are effectively guaranteed uh, the, to the government. The government has essentially a locked in majority because a lot of the seats are filled by these a very narrow con uh, functional constituencies. And several of them, there's never even a contest to see who gets voted, gets elected. They just have one candidate. And uh, several others are very much dominated by this pro-establishment camp. So both in that and in an election committee that chooses the chief executive, the people, the legislators that represent the majority of Hong Kong people are relegated to a minority status. So the kind of pushback that they've been attempting is very understandable. Now, this thing is built in deeply to the whole one country, two systems model. Well, let, let me interrupt you there because we'll come back to the structure of Hong Kong's government. And I'd like for you to say something in addition to you know, the legislative council, the chief executive, also the district councils, the avenues for popular action, popular expression. Uh, and in the book, there's quite a lot, of course, on people taking to the streets, uh, you know, voting with their feet uh, to articulate particular points of view. And so that comes through really clearly in the book. And this is a dramatic moment. Uh, you know, we saw the national security law put in place just a few months ago, and we're starting to see how it might affect action. But in the book, you tell us that the basic problem in Hong Kong lies in the joint declaration and in the basic law, in that it, it basically puts forward the notion of one country, two systems, but ultimately it's the one country that gets to decide so many things. Can you elaborate on this fundamental tension in the joint declaration and in the basic law and how that has been the subject of this push-pull for many years? Well, for listeners new to this, of course, the joint declaration is the treaty by which Hong Kong uh, was returned or turned over to China, depending on how you view it. Uh, this was territory that was taken from China in the 1840s uh, under you know pressure from uh, sort of imperialist powers. And so it was colonialism, unadulterated, uh, that prevailed in Hong Kong over these many years. 
Uh, but the Hong Kong that the British got at the time had about 7,500 people living in it. So it was basically a few fishing villages. So the city that, that was created there, the Chinese people that moved in afterwards are largely responsible for creating, along with the British. The British created the environment that sort of protected the area from all the machinations that the uh, 20th century brought to China. And so there was Hong Kong, this great city being born and growing. In fact, a good portion of the population are people who fled mainland China after 1949. I mean, that's in probably the majority, the, the, the young people of Hong Kong today, they're their grandparents uh, came there. So there, Hong Kong uh, existed in this, it was created in this sort of way. The joint declaration acknowledged that Hong Kong was so successful that the per capita income of the city was equal uh, to, to you know, world-class standards, the first world. Uh, and so the, it tried to protect that and it acknowledged that, that Hong Kong uh, needed to be protected from the mainland system. So they have two systems. At the same time, China wanted to reacquire sovereignty over Hong Kong. So that was the deal. Uh, and when they reached th this agreement, they really put a lot of stuff in there to try to protect Hong Kong, that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights would apply in Hong Kong, that the rule of law under the common law would be maintained, that, they, that a whole list of rights, uh, I think I counted about 16 of them, uh, were in this joint declaration, and half of them were free speech in one form or another. So there was no question that was committed to Hong Kong was a kind of liberal system, a, a constitutional system. And democracy was promised in the form that all the legislators would be elected in Hong Kong. It wasn't fully stated that in that regard for the chief executive, it would be, he was, he or she was to be chosen by elections or consultations. And the, and the joint declaration is typically related all of this into the basic law. And the basic law has all of it, except for a couple limitations. And I point this out in the book, the two areas where, where it's fraught. One is uh, the Chinese National People's Congress Standing Committee has the ultimate power of interpretation under the basic law. So while the courts are promised as a joint declaration required to be independent and final, if Beijing doesn't like the decision they make, it, it, it in fact could overrule it. Now the, the, joint, the joint declaration and the basic law itself specified that this would be within in the scope, outside the scope of autonomy of Hong Kong. So that was one thing, the promised autonomy. And if we shift to the basic law, which carries on this task, we can see that it was, it was also very mindful of autonomy. It said that mainland uh, departments uh, under the central government should not interfere in Hong Kong, that mainland laws should not apply in Hong Kong unless they're added to Annex 3. All of these guarantees of freedom and so on were there. But again, in Article 158, the ultimate power of interpretation was given to the Standing Committee. And soon after the handover, 1999, a case called the Right of Abode case about uh, youngsters whose parents are from Hong Kong uh, was decided in the courts. And the government asked actually in a motion that this be referred to the Standing Committee because the court was in effect going to overturn a local ordinance that was trying to block these youngsters from being brought into Hong Kong. And the court said, no, this is within the scope of our autonomy and uh, refused uh, that uh, referral to the standing committee and the government ran around the court. So this is one major problem in the thing that the government, whenever there's a sensitive matter can threaten to refer the matter to the standing committee, even though the basic law makes no mention of this, this is one area. The other area, this interpretation power is also involved in that the, the, the basic law actually used better language than, than the joint declaration. It said the ultimate aim is universal suffrage in selecting the chief executive. Uh, and it said this would be done by gradual and orderly progress. So that's all well and good. And that Hong Kong locally could decide on its own if the legislature was to be uh, democratized and only had to report it to the standing committee. But in 2004, Beijing intervened and said, no, 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 we have to approve that even before you start trying to do it. And so the promise of democratic reform was put in Beijing's hands as well. And what, when you see people protesting on the streets in Hong Kong in all these intervening years, 23 years now, you can bet 
that what they're protesting over are these two problems. One is they're worried that the rule of law will be undermined if Hong Kong's autonomy is undermined. And the Hong Kong people on the street in their wisdom understand the only way to get a government that's going to defend Hong Kong's autonomy is to elect it. So they're, either, they're, they're protesting over democracy, but they're also protesting over the autonomy of Hong Kong and maintaining these commitments to Hong Kong, which are vital. I mean, why do people care about Hong Kong? Because it has the rule of law. And I would suggest here, and it's not just that it's a financial center, it's a global center. I try to emphasize that in the book. It's like New York, it's like London. It's one of the three or four great cities in the world that everybody knows about that represents a large segment of the world as a, a center of culture, of education, of business, of finance. So this is the city we're talking about. And the people who live there are incredible in that they run a city that's so successful in such a challenging environment on the coast of China. And so this is what's at stake. When they're protesting in 2003, the government in Hong Kong, which is not directly democratically elected, of course, is trying to please China by carrying out its commitment under the basic law, Article 23, to enact national security laws. So they proposed this bill. A number of us didn't think the bill they proposed was very reform-minded. So we organized a group called the Article 23 Concern Group. We wrote a bunch of pamphlets and we distributed them on the street. I actually wrote one of them myself. And we distributed these on the street, uh, literally standing outside of metro stations, handing them out, people looking at you with great suspicion and you hand this thing to them. And they were printed in different colors. And the people started calling them the rainbow pamphlets. We thought maybe we would make this national security law Beijing wanted to pass at least unpopular. Little did we know the Hong Kong people took it to their hearts. They went to the street, a half a million of them, and eventually that bill was withdrawn. So this is sort of setting the stage that, well, if the government's not going to defend Hong Kong's autonomy, we the people will. And they did that again in 2012 when the Beijing tried to impose uh, patriotic education. Then a whole new generation came out of youngsters. And that same youngsters, those same youngsters, became the leaders of the protest movement in 2014, demand the so-called umbrella movement. And again in 2019, to stop another national security law uh, that the government in effect won, it's an extradition law actually, but it's, it's sort of aiming at being able to enable China to reach uh, actions that people in Hong Kong are involved in. So this this kind of law was proposed, this extradition law. And again, the people pushed back, but always, always bringing out democracy. That we want a government that will represent us. Yeah, and you've done a great job actually uh, answering a couple of the questions that I was about to ask, but I want to focus in on what you've just said. Uh, the first point is that the, the basic law includes a lot of protections for civil liberties and promises for progress towards uh, direct democracy in the sense of not everybody voting on everything, but uh, every Hong Kong resident having the right to participate in the selection of those who will make and implement the laws, right? You've, you've highlighted, you've highlighted that. And that was adopted in 1990. And so that's in the shadow of the Tiananmen demonstrations, uh, international pressure. There's a lot going on in 1990. Seven years pass, Hong Kong returns to Chinese, Chinese sovereignty and things move forward. Why has China's government backed away or do you think that they have backed away from promises and a procedure outline, uh, outlined in the basic law? Or is it, be, is it in reaction to uh, the demonstrations, the, uh, the memorials for uh, June 4th, uh, the uh, anti-national uh, security legislation uh, that you were part of that resistance to in 2003? What has led this? Or was this always going to happen? What, what either changed 
in Hong Kong, changed in the Chinese leadership? Well, I, I would say uh, that the, the sort of uh, foundation for this problem was laid way back. Uh, and, and what I think it is, is that government I described that's basically beholden to Beijing and really complicit in Beijing's designs really never found its voice in Hong Kong. And I see this as a root problem of a lot of this, because very often we would see local so-called pro-Beijing figures pushing a, a hard line against uh, opposition that even Beijing officials hadn't thought of yet. And so I think what, what, what happened is this model was very inventive. And if it had been carried out, I think it would have worked. I don't think Hong Kong people are inherently uh, that activist or political. In fact, when I first ta taught there, I mentioned in the book that I asked my class what they would want to have happen in the, uh, if they could choose. This was back in 1985, my first class. And, and they says, well, they refused my question and at first said, well, we, we weren't asked to choose. We have no voice in this. So humor me. I've just arrived. What would you do if you could do it? And they literally chose, uh, almost all but one student chose that they would return Hong Kong to China and hire the British to run it. <laughs> so so this, this is quite interesting because it shows that they had very little confidence in China's form of governance, but they were Chinese at that stage. They understood themselves to be Chinese. And as colonized people, there was some attraction to being part of, of, of China. At the same time, a great deal of trepidation about how China would run things, giving the track record. I mean, this was not long after the Cultural Revolution in China. So that was it. Uh, and, and my sense of it is, and I wrote, you mentioned a book, I wrote Constitutional Confrontation in Hong Kong. I was predicting there was going to be a confrontation because perhaps I was a little cynical about whether these people that are assigned by Beijing to run Hong Kong would truly represent Hong Kong or they would just be doing Beijing's bidding. And, and I suppose why they would do that is there's some reward in that. They, they get appointments to positions if they're in business and there's a large pro-business, pro-establishment camp. They might get advantages in the China trade and doing business in China. Uh, so, and, and then China starts creeping across the border to do business in Hong Kong. And that would also be to their advantage. So I think that the result is that they never found their voice to help Beijing to understand what was important. And I think Beijing sort of understood it or they wouldn't have agreed to it in the joint declaration. But at the same time, Beijing's uh, DNA is not one that would favor running an open society on its own directly. So I think this is why in the book, I was very mindful to try to trace the roots of the current problem. Uh, and I think the current problem is a very real problem. It's a very serious problem for Hong Kong. But it's important to understand that this design probably wasn't that bad if you could leave it alone, which was not in Beijing's DNA. And it was not in the minds of these Hong Kong officials to, to do what they needed to do to help this system to work, to represent Hong Kong's concerns. They wouldn't have to be at war with Beijing, but they would need to find their voice. And I don't think they ever did because they were too busy trying to please Beijing. And so the result is they created this environment where the only way to be heard for Hong Kong was from the street. And so protests ensue. And of course, Beijing is flabbergasted, doesn't quite know what to do. To its credit, it tries to hold off for a number of years and see if it can get Hong Kong officials to solve the problem. But I think the, the, the fundamental problem is no one was listening to Hong Kong people. And, and so there, that chance, that perception they, they might enjoy of being able to participate and to be able to secure this autonomy that they have uh, was really lacking and, and they, their mistrust of the Hong Kong government and Beijing's design grows over time to the point where last year in 2019, they, I, most notably in the Legislative Council, when they occupied it, uh, kind of vandalism, uh, they, there was a poster on the wall, you taught us that nonviolence doesn't work. Uh, and that kind of expressed it all that these youngsters thought, well, you old guard pan-Democrats, 
you know, you've been doing these marching for years. You, you, we've just this June, they just before this, they had two million people had marched on the streets, and I think June sixteenth of last year, uh, a million the week before that, and all of this seems to get nothing. No one listens to us, and so I think this is at the very heart of what's going on. So Beijing, of course, is not very、uh, trained to listen. To people, it's not a democracy,、uh, and so its way of solving public resistance is repression, is to try to stamp it out by force. And without any Hong Kong voice against this, that's what ensues. And it's interesting. No matter what happened over the last two years, no one in the Hong Kong government st- stood up and said, "No, we're not going to do this," or "No, this is not acceptable." It's very disturbing to see how everyone just goes along with、uh, whatever Beijing wants to do, almost celebrating it as they were today. The idea that all the opposition is taken out of the legislature. Oh, what a great legislature! One without opposition in it. You know, so so this I think is at the heart of the problem. Is and and you've already identified that there's a structural reason why. To speak, the Hong Kong people can't just vote; they have to go to the street. You've identified the fact that you've got a, a legislative council that is set up to,、uh, you know, with these functional constituencies and things like that that、uh, are not competitive in the way that some of the other constituencies are. And so, who then can really say they speak for Hong Kong? Carrie Lam was elected、uh, in an election where people were、uh, all welcome to vote, but she had been nominated. She had been vetted, and only vetted candidates were permitted、uh, to run. So Hong Kong has difficulty. You know, the, who speaks for Hong Kong? Who can、yeah. say I have the mandate of the people? Yeah, I, I think this. Yeah, but wait, the way Carrie Lam. Was elected,、uh, if you will. There's an election committee, and there's about 240,000 voters who are mostly made up of functional sectors like the legislature. And in this election, this election committee was to be the interim model until the universal suffrage was achieved. And those voters are so much in the pro-Beijing camp and the pro-establishment camp by the way it's designed. That、uh, when pan democrats have played with it and tried to just highlight this deficiency by running, they can at most get about twenty percent of the vote. Okay, and a couple of times they've done that. So basically, it's a, a Beijing、uh, shop、mm-hmm. that elects <laughs>、uh, Carrie Lam, and and because Beijing, these people in the in this election committee all answer to Beijing.、Uh, they Beijing pretty much stands behind the scenes and. Signals who it wants、uh, to be elected in this process, and so Carrie Lam, who had earned a, a lot of Beijing favor、uh, because she chaired a consultative committee、uh, in 2014,、uh, that was、uh, 2014 and 15. Actually, it ended in 2015 over democratic reform. At that time, Beijing had made a promise that they would consider this universal suffrage. When they finally authorized them to proceed with this democratic reform model, and she headed the consultation process, and the consultation process basically did whatever Beijing wanted,、uh, and eventually Beijing said, "Well,、uh, the only way this will、uh, we will allow all the people to vote, all Hong Kong people of eligible voting age to vote,、uh, would be." Uh, if we vet the candidates in advance, and they they set up the way they were, they wanted they made the election committee into the nominating committee in this proposal. This is what was to happen, and obviously the pan democratic camp in opposition saw the move, and and they had enough votes because two thirds votes were required in the legislative council, and they had over one third, so they were able to block this model. So this election committee remains, and that's how Carrie Lam、uh, was was chosen.、Uh, so what you see in the structure of this is, therefore, the executive branch of government is totally dominated by Beijing, and all talk of universal suffrage 
uh, aims to maintain that dominance uh, by vetting candidates uh, who can be presented to the voters, kind of like I think they do in Iran with the Guardian Council. Okay, so that was it. And, and then the Legislative Council, there are some voices because half the legislators were directly elected. So there's some voice of the people there, a few people from the pro, and it's a, a proportional representation system sort of designed to keep minorities uh, to have some representation. So the pro Beijing camp even wins some of those seats as well. And so some of those directly elected seats and the legislators kind of divided into two halves for some kinds of actions it takes. At the same time, legislators are not allowed to propose bills that affect policy or involve expenditure. So it's a kind of a powerless legislature. Uh, and all they can do is essentially approve the government's agenda and hold hearings, investigations, and so on. Now, the legislators in this minority, the opposition legislators, all they can do is kind of, they, their job is to obstruct the government, basically, because that's the only way they can represent the people. They have no power to actually pass things. And so they get comfortable in that role, and that's what they do. They have no chance to, to take power. It's not a parliamentary system. Beijing says it's executive-led system. So that there you have it. So both the executive and the legislature are under Beijing's thumb. And although the legislature is cantankerous until today when the opposition just finally walked out, okay? So that's it. The other third branch of government are the courts. The courts in Hong Kong are highly respected. The rule of law in Hong Kong has been rated among the top in the world by people who rank these sorts of things for many, many years. Uh, very British in their tradition, wearing wigs and robes and all of this stuff, but it uh, sort of you know uh, brings dignity to the process. Uh, and so they have great reputations. There's a judicial selection commission that chooses them uh, you know, for appointment. Uh, there's foreign judges put on the top court of final appeal uh, in order. They're invited in as visitors, sort of. They, they take up uh, kind of part-time uh, assignments in that court. So that was thought it would create uh, more independence for the the court that, that, that these foreigners wouldn't, who are often retired chief justices of the UK or Australia or something, very eminent jurists, so they wouldn't go along with any kind of shenanigans. So they, they would uphold the rule of law. So that, that's the way the court was. But that proved for Beijing to be a problem because then those judges, they're always obstructing everything. So we've got to tame them as well. And so recently there's been a lot of attacks on the court. When last year there was like 10,000 protesters arrested. And so a lot of these things come up for trial and, and the judges obviously notice the police have no case against most of these people who are randomly picked up on the street on various occasions. And the police haven't built a proper case and they're dismissed or uh, various things, they're allowed out on bail and some of them even try to flee Hong Kong. So all of this is going on. So when Beijing passes this national security law, it decides, well, we're gonna control this. It provides in the national security law that only a select list of judges can uh, participate, uh, can hear these national security cases, okay? Uh, and if any judge in exercising his power, uh, makes statements against national security or violates national security, then he will be taken off the list. And so in effect, how would a judge do that? Of course, a judge would only do that in a court case. They, they're not politicians, they're judges. So, they, and frankly, in the past, their selection was probably better than a lot of federal judge selection processes in our own country, you know, because it's less politicized with this election, uh, selection, uh, judicial selection com committee. So, so this is is what Beijing is trying to tame them, and and then some judges are persisting anyhow, because a lot of these cases are public order cases; they're not coming up under the national security law, and they're being dismissed. And Beijing in the, in, has designated a branch of the police and a branch of the Justice Department as national security branches. And they're tending to wrap the old public order cases in the national security cases in a way that, that in effect, they're politically treating these all as threats 
and and they're uh, throwing people out of the legislature and so on for for their behavior. Uh, and so this means that in effect, the court now, whenever it releases someone or lets them out on bail, they're attacked by pro-Beijing figures in Hong Kong, by Beijing officials in Hong Kong, um, Beijing officials on the mainland. So it's very clear that they view the court as a threat to their, their, their current effort to control Hong Kong. Uh, and so now, in effect, all three branches of government face this threat. I think judges, a lot of them, are, are, I admire greatly because they're standing their ground. But I just don't know how long this can carry on when there's no political support uh, for their work. Uh, and so this is the real problem of Hong Kong's autonomy right now. Well, and in fact, in this answer, you've put both ends of the uh, book subtitle together, uh, oh, yeah. making making Hong Kong China, rollback of autonomy, and the rule of law, right? Yeah. This kind of question. If I could take you back uh, to this electoral process again, uh, because we have a question from uh, someone you, you know well, a fellow Hong Kong academic, David Zweig, who asks about the the offer of having some sort of uh, tamed nomination process, yep. uh, controlled nomination process. And, you know, he, he highlights what you've just taken us through, that the pan-democratic front uh, blocked that, blocked yep. that from moving forward. And, you know, he, he speaks of an interview that he had with one of those legislators. Uh, and he suggests that they got this wrong, that the pan-Democrats should have accepted this as a at least a step in the right direction. What do you think? I, I, know, I know David had taken this position back at that time, uh, and, and I think it was an op-ed and so on. I less sanguine about that. I, I, I get the argument. The argument would be you get your foot in the door. And like Aung San Suu Kyi's allegedly trying to do in Myanmar, and then maybe you expand the space you have. But I think, uh, at least as I understand how the pandems viewed it, they viewed it that this, because even Carrie Lam, uh, or, or, I forget it was her, I guess it was Lung, but Carrie Lam was in the, uh, yeah, it was Carrie Lam in the consult consultative committee, said that this was it, that this was the universal suffrage. So the suggestion was that this was the final thing that they would get. Uh, and I think their view was that, well, if you have a choice between a non-democratic government that you're pushing up against, uh, which at least lacks legitimacy, or a democratic government that's effectively formed in the same way, but through uh, you know, a kind of pretense of genuine choice in the voters, and you wind up more or less with the same people, then you have less power against this government than you would uh, because now it's a pseudo democracy and you even approved of its uh, the model that created it. So I think this is how the pandems, I'm, I'm not sure if that's every single player, everybody has their own uh, analysis, but I, I think as a, as a body, this is how they viewed it, that this would just you know be a fake democracy and that with it, they would have no leverage to push forward. Now, I was interviewing these people last fall, as you, as you mentioned, in, in uh, Hong Kong in December. Uh, and surprisingly, in spite of the world all thinking the PLA was going to march to the streets of Hong Kong, uh, most of the pandems that I interviewed still thought that Beijing really wouldn't go so far as to destroy Hong Kong uh, and that they they can ultimately prevail if they stand their ground and keep pushing and and the cost that all that imposes that they will get somewhere. Now, they may be delusional as we look at it in hindsight uh, and the way Beijing now has in effect cracked down and even then was cracking down through the Hong Kong police. But that hopefulness, I think, I suppose is, a, is the mark of of Democrats around the world and, and human rights activists, that, that uh, there's a certain belief that 
that justice will prevail and that the right path will ultimately win out and those who are on the other side or on the other wrong side of history, as they put it. So I think that that they viewed this offer of a kind of uh, fake democracy in their view uh, as more problematic than going on with at least a government they, they can discredit. Uh, and they had no problem discrediting Beijing's offer because it clearly was designed. It, it, it said that not only could you only have three nominees, but everyone had to have 50% support in that uh, nominating committee that was proposed, which was the election committee. And there's no way a Democrat would get through that. And now when we look, and they know perhaps better than all of us, the pro-establishment politicians. And now when we look at them all celebrating the departure of the Democrats from the Legislative Council, maybe their judgment was right that these people know they're not going to let you get your foot in the door and, and then uh, push the door open. Rather, they're going to be even more indignant about your opposition. Look, you've got your democracy, shut up. So I think that's the judgment they're making. And, and it was a very difficult one to make, but I think that they, they, they made it. Right, so that rather than accepting uh, this compromised, in their view, compromised structure, let's just stay in opposition. Uh, to this, because that keeps it clear, uh, right. rather than having that that the other. Now you highlighted optimism that uh, you know people who are pushing you know for greater public accountability and for these things they have to be optimistic to you know throw themselves against against this. Does, is there reason for optimism today? The, I think one of the PMs, uh, in fact, the leader said, it's the end. It is the end of one country, two systems. We now just have one system. And that's not very optimistic. I agree. I think uh, and you'll notice in the book that I stick these little pages in the middle of each chapter highlighting what I thought was the public mood at the time, whether it was hopefulness or intrepidation. And I put in the last uh, chapter uh, about the local condition, uh, uh, fear uh, that now settled in is, is a, almost a hopelessness and a great deal of fear that, uh, that many of them will be sent to jail uh, and uh, punished uh, that and the hopelessness is that Beijing has basically abandoned the one country, two systems model. Uh, and that constitutional confrontation I wrote about long ago is, is going on because uh, these, these institutional weaknesses uh, that I saw. I can say as a footnote here, when in that book I had advocated a basic law committee to resolve the disputes between the parties, but they created a basic, and my basic law committee was one very common in civil law traditions, uh, uh, an independent body made up of some representatives of the autonomous region uh, and some from the central government uh, that would resolve matters openly and fairly. Instead, the basic they created a basic law committee uh, that advises the National People's Congress Standing Committee, but it's all done behind closed doors with no openness. And so the general perception on the street is, Beijing decides it and then tells the Beijing committee what advice to give, basic law committee what advice to give, <laughs> and that, that pretense is, is maintained. So this is, is, is I think, the source of, of hopelessness today that there seems to be almost no mechanisms left. Now, what the, where your question leads us is whether, what will they do when this election occurs next year? Uh, it's it's a good guess as to what, whether they will try to run because most of the people, the prominent politicians in the opposition are going to be barred under this system that now they're vetting candidates. Used to be these election officials only wanted to check to see how old you were and whether you were a Hong Kong uh, resident or a citizen, depending on which office you're running for. But now they're vetting whether you're patriotic or loyal. And, and unfortunately, they've, they've wrapped the national security law into this question. So it seems that the four that were kicked out were kicked out prominently because they, they opposed the national security law. 
So now just upholding the basic law appears to mean you uphold the national security law. And, and I talk about in the book how the national security law has effectively become part of the basic law. Uh, but that, that's a, a, an interesting thing to look at and people will find interesting and there's different views on that. But in any case, uh, so now that, that uh, ability to run next year is going to be decided by the government, not just you know the uh, government deciding who can uh, who can run for chief executive. In effect, they've now empowered themselves, and this decision that was made this week right. effectively empowers the government to block anybody from the legislative council that Beijing doesn't think is patriotic enough. And being against the national security law means you're not patriotic enough. So there you have it. So then I suppose the choice will be come down to uh, a kind of either running and trying to find and scramble and find people who will be allowed to run uh, or boycotting the thing entirely. And I just, at this point, we have no way of knowing how that's going to come out. I, I can imagine they, they might just boycott it because if you can't be in opposition and still stay in the legislative council, then people might wonder well, what's the point. Well, and so far, at least, you can be in opposition to the Hong Kong government, but not critical of this legislation and yeah. perhaps not critical of some of the things that the Hong Kong government says it's doing, you know, in the name of this legislation. And yeah. Can I inject here? The national security law says, though, that if you speak or act in a way that brings contempt on either government or hatred towards either government, then you're violating the national security. You're, you're co committing subversion. Uh, so it, 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 and they accuse people from time to time who are in opposition of just that. In fact, they even accuse the, the, the opposition camp uh, of, of violating the national security law just by organizing a primary election to help them whittle down the candidates that would run for office. So, I mean, anyone who wants to study how authoritarianism works to take over an open society, this is a textbook case. I, I do a lot of work, comparative work across Asia. And quite frankly, uh, this has everything in it. And, and what's striking is how the people in charge now in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government you're speaking of, are either clueless as to what they're really doing. They, they don't seem to get it that what they're doing is literally, as the politician you mentioned said, destroying the one country, two systems model. Well, exactly. And, and you know, international perceptions, uh, perceptions within China, however, have been of the sort, and again, this is not a scientific rendering, but many people feel that Hong Kong uh, is getting its just desserts, that it's had privileges that we don't have, and it shouldn't complain about being forced to be China, to be forced mm -hmm. to be part of uh, this, this China led from Beijing. Yeah, there's a kind of attitude that you're a bunch of crybabies. Look, you have all of this, and, and now you're complaining. And this tends to be a, an, an attitude that's encouraged in China. I mean, it's encouraged even about the Tibetans and others, like the, the, the argument on Tibet is, well, we spend so much money there, we're transferring so much of our wealth to you guys, why are you complaining? Um, the, the Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, the same kind of thing could be said. It has more dimensions uh, as involved in the patriotism and so on. And then in Hong Kong, the same kind of argument that you have these privileges. But the thing is, is, is this underappreciates that Hong Kong was already an open society with uh, a world, you know, first world uh, uh, level of wealth uh, that those people had earned, uh, like a lot of other people around the world, working their way up and establishing the, the conditions that, that, that prevailed in Hong Kong. That's one part of it. And another part of it is it's actually very advantageous to the rest of the country that Hong Kong... Uh, fights, if we can use that analogy, way above its weight, mm -hmm. uh, and that it's it's one of the most valuable assets in the Chinese uh, 
country. I mean, I, I think they even have a, a party platform that uh, includes an article in it that, that says, uh, highlights the importance of maintaining one country, two systems as one of the fundamental policies of the People's Republic of China. So this, this uh, they're not crybabies. They, they're really trying to help China to have what it's trying to have in Hong Kong. Actually, I think that that is in some ways way more patriotic uh, than simply saying whatever Beijing wants to say, even if it damages the, the thing that, that that person's responsible for, which is Hong Kong. So, so uh, I think there's a, a response to it, but in China, that voice is not heard uh, very much because uh, the, the press freedom doesn't exist there. And so uh, a lot of opinions about Hong Kong are shaped by the mainland media. Yeah, if you've not visited Hong Kong, if you haven't experienced an open society such as exists in Hong Kong, it's hard to imagine how different that could be or how fragile it might be. Oh, yes, exactly. And so I think this is what's on the table. And now, I mean, the kinds of earlier threats to Hong Kong's autonomy are, are almost past tense now. Now the, the Beijing under the national security law has set up uh, a, a local committee to safeguard national security headed by the chief executive that's answerable directly to the central people's government. And, and then Beijing appoints an advisor, which is its top official in Hong Kong, to be the advisor to this committee. Uh, and of course, uh, we like to think it's, you know, it's the supervisor of the committee because it represents Beijing, but it doesn't stop there. The national security law provides the setup of an office of the central people's government to safeguard national security in Hong Kong. And this office is to be staffed entirely by mainland officials, and they are to be in charge in a way of all national security work uh, to oversee it along with the committee, but they, they have more influence because they represent the central people's government. And they're going to mobilize, bring down members, I guess they're already there, of the Public Security Bureau of State Security from the mainland. So you're going to, there is in effect now a secret police who can do all of this. And the sad truth is that both committee and the office are not subject to judicial review. Uh, it says the word judicial review as to the committee that their actions are not subject to it, but it says the office of the mainland is not even subject to local jurisdiction. And, and so, I mean, this, I wish that was the worst of it, but this office can also uh, take people that it feels violates national security across the border and try them on the mainland if it doesn't want to try them, if it's a complex or serious case, as they put it. So uh, the threat to Hong Kong's autonomy and way of life now uh, is much more dramatic and direct under this national security law. And I think that's why the international response has been very critical of this because Beijing long ago asked foreign governments, including the Washington, uh, to uh, treat Hong Kong separately based on uh, the agreement that we discussed in the beginning of, of our discussion today. And now, uh, when this this agreement is not kept, these governments are are complaining and imposing sanctions. And uh, it seems to me they have a right to do so since they were asked by by China to to uh, treat Hong Kong separately. The United States has said uh, there's no longer uh, autonomy, and so that uh, separate treatment has been withdrawn. Yeah, so you've just given uh, the case against optimism in the yeah. sense of, you know, how uh, nefarious some of these uh, procedures could be, yeah. uh, you know, if, if implemented. Uh, but then you've highlighted the international environment and the reaction to this, including the U.S. Uh, first congressional action, then executive action, uh, taking away the differential treatment that Hong Kong receives. And we have a question that was submitted by David DeVos, a journalist, and he asks, uh, apart from the United States, who is criticizing these moves in Hong Kong? Uh, you know, perhaps you could highlight a little bit more about not just European nations, but nations in Asia, Latin America, Africa. 
that may be critical? I think the level of criticism is greatest from democracies and, and mostly in Europe. Uh, we know Germany and France and, and England and the United States have all taken public positions against this. I think the UK has taken a more robust stance by saying that uh, what is called a BNO, British National Overseas Passport Holders, could and their families could uh, move to the UK and es eventually establish uh, citizenship there. And that group of people are basically all Hong Kongers who were alive on, when Hong Kong was uh, transferred to China in 1997. So it leaves out the youngsters. Uh, but I think there's, this, uh, as I understood it, they, they could come in as the children of, of BNO holders, uh, as family members and so on. So there, there are big debates about what to do because the, the most active protesters have been youngsters, many of them born after 1997, so they couldn't get a BNO uh, passport. But we're talking about around 3 million people, uh, almost half the population of Hong Kong. Britain has offered them a, a right of, to come to Britain to move there, uh, which they didn't do back when the Sino-British Joint Declaration was signed and the basic law was enacted. At that point, Britain thought claimed that it had left Hong Kong in good shape and that it left them with a, a good uh, guarantees of their uh, basic rights and liberties and rule of law and autonomy. So th this offer was not uh, given, but now it has been given in, in the UK. So that's one response. I think the responses in other places, I, I, I haven't been following them all. I, I seem to recall there's some statements about this in India has, has made statements, but it's also had a recent very contentious relationship with China. I think uh, some of the adjoining countries to China have been more silent because they 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 are very much at risk of Beijing's wrath. Uh, they depend somewhat a lot more than other parts of the world on, on trade with China and, and China's goodwill. So I think there's not been a lot of uh, heard there. And I think a, a lot of that is true also across the Latin America and Africa where China has, is uh, engaging in foreign aid and, and, and lending, especially. Uh, that's a whole new story. We could, we could have several panels on, so I won't go down that road. But, but I think uh, China does, the point is China has a lot of leverage and the leverage is, is pronounced when it comes to the underdeveloped countries. But even in Europe, China has long been very good at playing one European power against another if you give us trouble, then we'll treat you badly. This is a kind of united front, a policy that China uses, uh, and it will punish you and we will reward those people who don't speak up against us. So even, and this is evident even in the human rights bodies of the UN where China's influence is large. So mobilizing a kind of hope that would be achieved by mobilizing international pressure on China is a very difficult task. But I think it's one that Hong Kongers uh, have put some emphasis on. Of course, Beijing knows this. That's why one of the four crimes under the national security law is collusion. And they're targeting collusion with foreign governments and so on. So all of this stuff is there. And there's not a lot of room for hope at the moment. Uh, one can only hope, uh, you know, calmer heads prevail at some point. But right now, uh, how this is going to unfold is not clear. We have an interesting question that comes to us from a career diplomat, uh, Brian Goldbeck. And his, he's got a, an, it's, it's a variation, a, a quite a different variation on a traditional question that uh, people in Taiwan who were offered, you know, another one country, two systems deal, and they were promised that they would, in fact, get a better deal than uh, prevailed in the case of, of Hong Kong, uh, that they are watching what's going on in Hong Kong and aren't interested in any kind of discussion that begins with one country, two systems. But Brian asks, is it possible that not having Taiwan as a potential target for one country, two systems. Has this encouraged Beijing to move away from that in Hong Kong? I, I don't think so that much. Of course, you could know for sure you'd have to get in the heads of Beijing officials, and they do in their heads have a big uh, soft spot for Taiwan. 
Uh, and the original design clearly was that, that the one country, two systems model, especially was aimed at Taiwan. And Hong Kong and Macau were kind of secondary um, targets for that. And, and, and I, but I think as time went on, uh, the value of Hong Kong became apparent and, they, and, and very much evident in the agreement itself in the basic law that mainland officials understood that, that they uh, were making extraordinary uh, strides to try to preserve the sort of vitality that Hong Kong represents and the rule of law and all of that, because it's very much their advantage. I think, uh, you know, something like two thirds of the companies on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange are mainland connected in some form or another. Uh, a, a large portions, you probably know better than I do, of money that goes out of China as investment and into China as investment passes through Hong Kong. So I think Hong Kong, in the end of it all, took on its, was its own case for one country, two systems. Uh, and, and I think for many years now, it's been understood that Taiwan wasn't that attracted to this idea that, that they were rejecting it uh, out of hand. Uh, it, they merely feel more justified in their rejection as the situation unfolds. But nonetheless, I, I think uh, the hope that that model was going to be the carrot that brings Taiwan to the table uh, has not been a prominent one for quite some time. Yeah, so uh, not many second thoughts about this in, in Taiwan. Uh, couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, and we need to be very quick uh, on the on the responses now. One that comes from one of the one of the attendees asks: uh, Has have people in Hong Kong missed out by not working to uh, explain their case more thoroughly, more widely to mainlanders? And. and you know, again, I mean, there are plenty of people from the mainland uh, working, studying. You've had them in your classes, um, you know, and so there is there, you know, there are a lot of folks with Hong Kong experience from the mainland. But this person asks, what, why wasn't this more systematic? Why wasn't this more successful? I think it's a, it, there is certainly a lot of effort. Uh, I was a part of a, a academic uh, committee uh, on uh, the China law program at Chinese University years ago, which was the first effort to sort of connect uh, both Taiwan and Hong Kong with mainland China uh, through law and exchanges and so on. So there were all these formal kinds of efforts in all the universities in Hong Kong have some investment in mainland behavior activities and, and all of them have mainland students. Uh, and tourist, tourism in Hong Kong has long been mostly dependent on mainlanders. Uh, so there was all of this going on, but it's all going on in the shadow of this increasing interference by mainland officials in Hong Kong. So the mainland, of, well, while ordinary people could get along probably fine, with mainland uh, sort of uh, interfering and putting pressure on Hong Kong and uh, ch chastising Hong Kong for not being patriotic enough and all of these then subsequent actions they take against Hong Kong, uh, there creates in the sort of ordinary people in Hong Kong, uh, at least some of them, a kind of uh, enmity towards mainlanders that, they, that we see some, from time to time in uh, bad relationships on the street between uh, mainland tourists who are flocking around. I mean, they're like tourists everywhere. Sometimes, you know, people, if you have, you're in a tourist destination, I'm from Hawaii. I know all about having lots of tourists. And sometimes there there's, can be some resentment towards these people and they, their sense perception. So interpersonal relations can suffer. Uh, and so that's happening at the same time that Hong Kong is become the, the New York City of China a kind of major financial center where everybody's passing through there and, and learning about Hong Kong. So it, it's cutting both ways, but I, I don't think there was a lack of effort uh, to explain matters uh, to, to, the, to the mainland and, and to try to help people to understand Hong Kong. But it's a difficult thing when you can't penetrate the mainland's media system. 
So on the one hand, you can talk to people on the ground and they can see what's going on. And mainland tourists go to Hong Kong, they go to Paris, they go to New York. So they're everywhere and they can see what open societies are like. But at the same time, they come home to a kind of propaganda world where uh, every little problem in, in those societies are, are broadcast across the media showing that democracy doesn't work and, and open societies don't work. And so it, the, the information war is going both ways. The uh, and again, we'll have to be have to be fairly brief. I'm going to try and group a couple of questions together, and one falls into the rule of law category uh, because, of course, that's one reason why a lot of business has been done in Hong Kong. Is that if there are disputes, you know, it's a recognized place that you can get a fair settlement, that you can get a fair hearing, that you know, dispute resolution, and things like that. And Hong Kong is a safe place, uh, you know, for visitors and for, you know, residents alike. Uh, you know, the, the, the problems with crime, things like that, not nearly what exists in some other places. And so one argument is, well, it works. It works. Be happy. Be satisfied. And we have one person in the Q&A area who has said, uh, could we trust protesters to have good judgment and to keep Hong Kong's business spinning forward? Why can't we be satisfied to have pro-business people, pro-Beijing people running things? Well, I, I think what I outlined in the beginning is at the heart of it, there's two things. One is Hong Kong people greatly value the rule of law. This is even in public opinion polls. Even ones conducted by Lao Tzu Gai, who's one of the leaders of the pro Beijing camp uh, years ago, uh, along with a colleague of mine at the time named Guan Xinxi, they concluded that the, the value, the core value in Hong Kong that's at the top of the list is the rule of law. Uh, and so there's a perception of more and more creep across the border of the mainland system, a kind of darkness at the edge of town, if you will, that corruption is coming across the border, that Hong Kong pro-Beijing camp, people get rewarded for pleasing Beijing, uh, for pleasing their mainland uh, counterparts. Uh, and so there's a perception, I think, a widely held one, that Hong Kong's rule of law is under threat. And, and then in that context, that the government, that, that this rule of law depends on autonomy and that the government is not positioned to defend that autonomy. And so if we say nothing today, tomorrow we'll just be the, another mainland city, or worse yet, we could be Tibet or Xinjiang, depending on how much national security law is imposed on Hong Kong. Uh, and so that is the threat that they're trying to head off. And they're, they widely, they're very astute. They understand that if they elected the government, uh, that they, that government would probably find its voice. I don't think anybody imagines it's going to be at war with Beijing, but that it would <clears throat> be more able to carry out that task of running an autonomous government within an authoritarian uh, country. So that that's no small task. And I think that's the judgment that people were making, at least the majority of them. And these protesters of course, represent the angry front of it. I've never been in a protest where there was where everybody behaved. I mean, it's just the nature of protest. Uh, in Hong Kong, these massive marches of two million people have, have for years been nonviolent. And even last year, the marches and stuff were nonviolent. I was there on December the 8th, I think it was, and I was talking to the organizer of that protest, uh, the people that applied for the permit, and they said, well, we're testing. We told the police to be careful not to push too hard. And we don't, and we believe in nonviolence and we think this will be nonviolent. And in fact, it was. The police kind of held back a bit that day and there was no violence either during the protest or after. So the vast majority, the news isn't about people being quiet and nonviolent. It's always about the one or two violent examples that emerge on a given day. Uh, but there's always never that total discipline that you can stop that. And I don't think Hong Kong's protesters should be judged 
by just that. I think uh, the, it, it's extraordinary. I was there during 2014 and 15. They were almost sweeping the streets. They were cleaning up after themselves in this occupation they had going. Uh, so I, I think Hong Kong people are to be credited uh, that they that this this violence in the face of what looked like police violence on the news every night uh, was was not a full account of what was going on. Yeah, the you know things that are on fire always get attention. Uh, yeah. Things you know those kinds of dramatic moments are magnets for attention and may not be representative on either side uh, in terms of the conduct of the police or the conduct of right. the protesters. Uh, but, you know, these things, you know, do happen. And so what's striking is in the example you just gave, uh, it appears that both sides wanted to avoid that and, right. uh, and, and talked about it uh, in advance, and maybe that played some role. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned about, you know, a, the rule of law is the protests in 2019 against the extradition law actually began in the le in legal circles and in the business communities who feared that this long arm would suddenly be present in Hong Kong. And so they stood, uh, they stood up. Now, I've got three questions that I'd like to get to in only just a couple of minutes for them. Uh, the first comes from a, uh, a version of this question comes from a couple of academics who have submitted it. And essentially, they're saying, why, why did people in Hong Kong think that democracy could be theirs? Uh, and one of the people says, you know, uh, you know, part of the founding story in uh, in the People's Republic of China is the notion of a new democracy, right? That sort of thing. And that didn't pan out. And another person cites uh, Elizabeth Economy's book about increasing authoritarianism under Xi Jinping. And so then the question is, did is it reasonable to expect some kind of... Uh, you know, some kind of situation where this authoritarian government could permit this autonomous unit? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it kind of let it go on. It was an, it was an open society, at least up until uh, very, uh, let's say last year, at least. It, it qualified as an open society. In fact, I think Freedom House ranked it as the freest place on earth. So it wasn't. So what you have to do when you're asking this question, and this question was asked a lot back during the handover, back in the '90s and even in the '80s, all these people would come with their suits and ties and briefcases uh, uh, and do some assessment of Hong Kong and and how come you guys believe that this can happen, and yet all these officials are are emphasizing this and the basic law uh, is being drafted and it it, it includes this and these promises are made. So when you're sitting in an open society and there's a change of, of, of the central government uh, and you're told that you can continue, don't worry, put your hearts at ease, then you you want to believe that. I think you want to believe that these these are grown-ups and they, they're very serious about it and they understand why this city is such a huge success and Hong Kong is a huge success but at that time and now by any estimate. And so I think that there, there's cause for that. Uh, and that why would an open society, and really I'm in New York right now, and it, the feeling of being in New York, the feeling of being in Hong Kong, isn't that different? You know, it, it shares this kind of robust business place where all kinds of things are going on, all in the, the, the city never sleeps kind of feeling. And so you would, it's hard to imagine. In fact, I begin the book by that because I know a lot of my readers are overseas. I don't have to begin with that in Hong Kong, but in my overseas readers, imagine a city like New York or London. That's what I start with. So I think when you're asking this question, and it is asked by a lot of people, it's a good question. Uh, there, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the people that, that were hearing these promises and commitments. Uh, and, and of course, they're not stupid. They know 
that they need to have some control over their government. And even the Beijing knew this. That's why it says the ultimate aim is universal suffrage. So that, that they couldn't withstand the pressures from that uh, hardline regime that was taking over without some political uh, influence over their future. So this is a very imaginative thing. And I, I'm sure people will be studying this because autonomy is one of those instruments that the world likes to use to address ethnic problems and nationalism problems and so on. So Hong Kong will may perhaps not be alone uh, in trying to do this kind of thing. So I think that's it. That's, that's the heart of why people uh, put their faith in it. The immigration that was going on before the sino British Treaty slowed down. Uh, and even a lot of the people who immigrated returned to Hong Kong. So, uh, and, and it's not like an exploding bomb and why you think you're not going to get maimed. It's, it's a nice place. It's a great place. Uh, I can say I spent most of my uh, adult life there and it's an extraordinary place. Uh, and and it's, it's hard to imagine that somebody will, will just damage it. And of course they do it in a kind of an unconscious way sometimes. Perhaps those pro-establishment figures imagine they were doing the right thing. But what we're seeing is the outcome of, of this approach. Uh, and I think they have their fingerprints on a lot of the problems themselves. So that, that's, I think, why people of Hong Kong approach it with this uh, optimism, at least up until recently. Well, I I'm certainly concur. I think it's wonderful to be in Hong Kong, and I miss not being able to visit just now. Uh, it is a special place with the dynamism that you've just talked about. And there are some people that have argued that Hong Kong could be an example for the mainland, that is specifically with a, uh, an independent judiciary where people feel that they can be heard. Uh, where, you know, issues can be brought and have suggested that if China were to uh, move its judiciary more in that direction, that that might bring greater social stability uh, within the mainland. So that is very much, uh, very much uh, present. I have two more questions. One uh, comes uh, to a, from a colleague of mine at USC. Uh, universities, of course, are very much engaged with universities in Hong Kong. World class, uh, world class schools there. Uh, tremendous scholarship that's being done. A lot happening. Uh, some people have suggested that academic freedom may be a threat. Uh, many academics think that this threat might be overblown. What is your take? Well, I think it's definitely under threat. Uh, whether the height of that threat is is still an unfolding question. We, we, we're we going to see what is done. I mean, the, the cases where they've uh, jailed academics or dismissed them uh, is still quite few. It's usually based on some allegation of a criminal act. But then when you look at the statements that are made uh, at the secondary level that, that and what's done there, there's been dismissals as teachers are now all, all admonished to stay in line and to teach Beijing's version of things. That patriotic education that was proposed in 2012 is now is seemingly going to be imposed. Uh, Regina Ip, one of the very most prominent members of the Legislative Council in the pro-establishment camp was even highlighting that now they can finally uh, do something about that, which the Democrats kept obstructing. Uh, and, and a lot of the youth that are protesting in Hong Kong began their protest as 14 and 15 year olds trying to preserve academic freedom in Hong Kong. So at the secondary level, it's under severe stress. At the tertiary level, uh, the university council has come to be it for Hong Kong University, especially because Hong Kong University's law faculty, where, where I teach, was especially under uh, Beijing's uh, critical eye and, and often attacked our former dean, uh, law dean Johannes Chan has been severely attacked. He was with me, one of the two academics years ago in the article 23 concerned that we're writing on national security law. So Johannes has a long tradition of fighting for the rule of law and basic freedoms in Hong Kong. And he spoke out against the, the dismissal of legislators today even. So 
uh, the law faculty, he was accused uh, when he was denied a promotion, he was accused of uh, facilitating Benny Tai, another colleague of mine in the law faculty who was recently dismissed, who organized the Occupy Central campaign in Occupy Central and Love and Peace. So, and Benny Tai now has been dismissed from Hong Kong U. He was convicted of, uh, I forget the exact crimes that, that he was charged with, but for the this uh, umbrella movement uh, and given 16 months in jail and he's on a, appeal. He served part of it and it's on appeal. Anyhow, all of that, these kinds of things are happening in the academy and this pressure that professors are making are misleading youngsters in Hong Kong is a very big part of Beijing's concern. And so in promoting these liberal ideas, like, like in my book, uh, I believe that this is what the only way you can make sense out of the sign of British Crown Declaration in the Basic Law was that it promised Hong Kong the rule of law and basic freedoms, and, and that this was, in a sense, a liberal model. Recently, I had to write another op-ed because Carrie Lam said that Hong Kong doesn't have separation of powers. She said this. She said that it, has a, it has separate branches of government with separate responsibilities, and they offer checks and balances on each other. Duh, that's separation of powers already. She just defined it, even while denying its existence. So I surmised in an op-ed that I guess she was just trying to say what Beijing wanted her to say. But Regina Hip today is coming out and say, well, they have to pass a law that says there's no separation of powers. They say there's an executive-led government. But all of us in, in the United States know we have an executive-led government. We have a presidential system. The separation of powers is most relevant in executive-led systems not parliamentary systems, because in the British parliamentary model, both the court and the legislature and the executive are all in effect one branch, the parliament. They all sit in parliament. And so uh, the separation of powers that we're talking about that exist in Hong Kong and the courts have so found exist. So all of this kind of stuff is going on right now. Uh, and and it's it's not clear that uh, where it's heading, where where the hope lies. Well, you've been really generous with your time. I, I want to get this, this last question in. And it comes, actually, there's a couple people who have asked versions of this question. Uh, but a Hong Kong native, uh, somebody who graduated from USC and is now a professor, uh, you know, here in, here in California, uh, her question is, what now? What is to be done? What would you suggest for not just young people, but the people of Hong Kong? Do you think, she asked quite bluntly, that people in Hong Kong have a future? That's a little bit apocalyptic, but she's getting at the, the question of erosion of civil liberties. Uh, because under the British, there was no democracy under, you know, uh, since 1997, maybe no democracy, but there was freedom of speech. There has been the ability uh, to protest, the ability to express oneself, to choose one's own way. And she's wondering, is that disappearing? Well, I think it is. Uh, it's unfortunate that basic freedoms in Hong Kong are under severe strain right now. It's interesting. I mean, I'm going to be on RTHK. I'm a regular there, the, the local public uh, radio station, on Monday talking about the dismissal of these legislators. That I can still do that is, is good. It's a good sign. And I write op-eds in the South China Morning Post. And a lot of people say, well, South China Morning Post is now owned by Jack Ma, of course, Alibaba company, a mainland company, a mainlander. Uh, and so there should be no there's skepticism about whether the post uh, continues to have that kind of freedom. But I, as a human rights professor in Hong Kong, uh, and half my students are not half, at least a lot of them are journalists. Uh, a lot of the people writing for the South China Morning Post have been my students. And I know they're all passionately doing their work to try to uh, help Hong Kong people to understand things, to exercise press freedom. So what, what I think the future looks like is a, a, perhaps if not a dramatic event, then drip by drip, people are going to keep pushing as best they can. Uh, journalists are gonna to try to do their job. Lawyers are going to try to do their job. 
judges are going to try to do their job. Some of them are going to be co-opted in all of those areas, and some are not. Uh, and if if the government persists in all this arrest and everything, presumably then they're going to have to keep arresting more and more people if people resist. And, I mean, even in China, in the face of extreme repression, people resist. So I think Hong Kong people will continue to resist. Uh, and some of them will do it by staying and doing what I just said. And some will do it by immigrating, taking up that offer from Britain or other offers that come on and working overseas. And they're a very extraordinary Hong Kongers uh, in California. I mean, Samuel Chu, who's the head of Hong Kong Democracy Council, lives there in Los Angeles. Uh, he's one of six people that Beijing has a warrant out just because what is, it, what is his crime? He's an American citizen who lobbied the US Congress to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Now, a lot of, so a lot of people will continue to do that. And a lot of non uh, people that are not originally of Hong Kong, who are really Hong Kongers at heart, or who have lived in Hong Kong for many years, like, like David Zweig and others, and myself, I, I suppose, can be included, will speak up and continue to speak up. I think this is kind of where we're at. Is there going to be some kind of place in the future where people will be listened to again? I guess that's the question. And a lot of that hinges on what are the what's the establishment going to do? What's the government going to do? Is there going to be uh, continued efforts at repression or is that going to pass? And, and then we can uh, see whether these freedoms can be protected. Michael, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for writing this book, which I think a lot of people are going to use. Uh, it's short, it's clear, it makes it very classroom friendly. Uh, and so I think that uh, many, many courses on China, many courses on law might be able to make use of this. I want to make an appeal uh, to the people who are with us here in the webinar uh, in a few days, you'll get an email letting you know that the video of our conversation is available on our website and on our YouTube channel. I hope that you will share that with others who weren't so fortunate to be with us today. And on behalf of the USC US China Institute, this large group of, of attendees, I want to say, Professor Davis, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for listening to this story about Hong Kong, and I hope they will read the book. Uh, I tried to make it as reader friendly as I can. You can judge better than I can whether I succeeded, but that, that was my goal because I think it's important for people to understand what's going on in Hong Kong. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as you said, Hong Kong is a global city and what happens there matters. And we want to thank you again for helping us better understand what's been going on uh, in these last couple of decades, and especially just in this last year. So friends, for all of you with us, thank you for giving of your time, and we look forward to having you back with us at the next USC, US China Institute uh, webinar. Again, thanks everybody, take care. <laughs>